This is Hashima Island, located in southern Japan. It was known for its mass coal production during the 20th century, and it played a significant role during the rapid growth of industrialization. The island has a total of 18 acres, and you can circle the island in total of less than 20 minutes. Coal was first discovered here in 1810, but it took 80 years later when mass production began. In 1890, the Mitsubishi company bought the island to make it a coal-producing powerhouse. They did this in to keep up with the West Colonial Powers. This island was once a striving community. It wasn't just a coal mine where workers stayed for a couple of months, then leave for vacation. Families lived here, kids went to school, vendors sold goods, and a dedicated hospital building for emergencies. There are other names this island is called. The most well-known is Gun Kanjima, which means Battleship Island, due to its close resemblance to an actual battleship. While this island was a symbol of rapid industrialization in Japan and was often praised, it's haunted by its dark history during the Second World War. Life here was quite different from the mainland. Being surrounded with water, resources are quite limited. Residents rely much on the outside world for shipments of foods, essential supplies, and other imports. One of the important resources was fresh water, and it was scarce. Reliant on shipments created a huge problem. Storms sometimes occur for days, which caused major delays. Thus, residents were often very conservative on how they consume their resources. In 1916, with the growing population, the company built the first concrete apartment to accommodate most of the residents. These concrete buildings were a big deal at the time, because wooden material was used when constructing apartments in Japan. The region was prone to have multiple strong typhoons, so taking this different approach was crucial to withstand these weather conditions. Each building had a different design. The first one was constructed that each apartment room was only 100 square feet with a tiny window and a sleeping mat. The follow building was a larger apartment complex but bigger footprints on each room and it was designed for a family. More than 30 buildings of these were crammed together. Neighbors could practically hear each other through the walls. Since the island was privately owned, they handpicked the people who will be working in the mines. The company also had the final say on who gets to stay on the island and they have the power to assign what building they will be living in. This was done based on hierarchy. On the very bottom were the single men. They are put together in the first apartment and sometimes had to share with a roommate. The next are the married men to prevent employees getting homesick. The company allowed family members to live with them and they were assigned on the second concrete buildings. Low-ranking workers were assigned to these crammed concrete apartments, and each of these apartment rooms did not have a bathroom, nor a kitchen. Instead, it was communal. They all had to share it. On the very top of the hierarchy were the managers of the company and high-ranking personnel. They were separated from the rest and lived on the summit of the island. They have their own place for themselves and away from the working-class people. In terms of the work conditions of the miners, it was brutal. Most of them worked long hours with little to no breaks in between. Also, the work itself was quite risky. They had to mine 400 feet under sea level with the climate temperature which reached 86 degrees Fahrenheit with 90% humidity. Apart from the mining jobs, there were also vendors that sold fishes, teachers, healthcare, and construction workers. The island contained all the essential services for a community. It had a hospital, schools, Shinto shrines, and for entertainment, it had a cinema, pachinko hall, and sports ground. Schools were kindergarten up to junior high school. Even with a crammed community, schools still had sporting grounds for students to exercise. On their leisure time, residents often just went out and fished. The tall seawalls that were built to protect from strong tides also became a fishing ground for the residents and a hot spot to relax and relieve stress. Although Japan is known for its vegetation due to its geographical feature and diverse climatic condition, the island lacked vegetation and earned the nickname, the island without green. There were no trees or any plants in sight, completely different from most cities and villages. It looked more like a prison with all the concrete block buildings and tall seawalls. In spite of its looks, the island was treated special compared to other cities in Japan. 
During World War II, all constructions of buildings across the country were halted, except for this island. They still continued to build concrete apartments since there was sharp demand during this period. However, there was a huge decrease of workers. Most of them were dispatched to the military, and as a result, the operation needed more manpower than ever. So to compensate this, they used captured civilians and prisoners of war to work in the mines. There is no exact number on how many were sent here during the war. Some say it was a couple hundred, while it could be up to over a thousand. Most of these workers were treated horribly. They were placed to live in a cramped building much worse than the Japanese workers. They were given very few rations. Sweet potatoes and string beans were their only food or sometimes they got nothing at all. They were constantly watched and ordered around by guards carrying swords. Most collapsed from exhaustion, some died from accidents, and in rare cases, died from malnutrition. Out of desperation, some even tried escaping the island. They jumped over the tall seawall, but ended up drowning from the strong tide. Survivors who lived through it described it as hell on earth. After the war, things in the island slowly improved. In 1957, they successfully built a pipeline along the seafloor. This now allowed residents to get easier access of fresh water without relying too much on the next shipment. By 1959, the population reached over 5,000, and it became the most densely populated area in the world at the time. Even though the island was getting crowded, the huge demand for workers continued to rise, and it was expected to reach 10,000 by the next 10 years. In 1963, people started growing their own little garden on the top of the apartment rooftop. They took soil from the mainland and planted vegetable and fruit. Signs of lifestyle improvement on the island was starting to show. They were no longer reliant with shipments and can now make their own food. However, just when things were getting better, a major decision by the Japanese government ignited a rapid decrease in population on the island. In 1960s, Japan's economy was booming, and they were in need for a better alternative of fuel to meet the demand. Petroleum came into the market, and it slowly replaced coal. Coal mines across the country began shutting down, and this little island was no exception. The company began laying off workers, and as a result, the total population in the island was gradually decreasing. The company finally closed on January 1974, then three months later, no human was left there. Throughout the time this island was occupied, they extracted 15.7 million tons of coal was hailed as a huge success. On the last day, one of the most iconic photos of the island was shot. And it was this, the aerial photo, Sayonara Hashima, which translates to, Goodbye Hashima. Today, the island became a tourist attraction and a popular destination for adventurers. The Mitsubishi company lost all the ownership of the island in 2002. With nobody left to maintain the buildings, vegetation eventually reclaimed the island. It was left untouched for many decades, until the early 2000s, when a huge interest sparked the island. However, visitation was only available for journalists and scientists in 2005. But it was soon opened for the public in 2009, and various service companies provide tour guides. To get to the island, it would take around 50 minutes sail ride from Nagasaki. Getting there is quite restrictive. Only a handful of weeks per year is allowed, and these services become unavailable during the typhoon season. Also, it is prohibited to go here alone. A licensed tourist guide must be present at all times. So if you wish to sail here alone with your boat, that could get you arrested. One hour is the maximum amount of time they can stay on the island, and they can only go to certain areas. In fact, 95% of the island is off-limits for visitors. This was put in place because there is a potential risk of the building collapsing. The 5% are the safe viewpoint that are quite far away from buildings. Today, a team of researchers visit the island periodically and hope to restore some building walls, so they preserve it and prevent it from collapsing. <laughs> <laughs>